Welcome back to another edition of COVID-19 from crisis to creation here on Mentorit TV. I'm Patricia falco Becali, your host. This episode, I thought, why not look at power? The power of the financial elite, the power of networking in the financial industry, and do networks actually make or break potentially the system? And in order to discuss that, I invited Sandra Navidi. Sandra, so good to see you. Welcome on Mentor TV. Thank you so much for having me, Patricia. It's a pleasure. Well, Sandra, before we get into the discussion, let me quickly share with our community who you are and what you've been doing. You're the founder and CEO of your consultancy company, Beyond Global. Um, you have worked for very famous and acclaimed economist Nouriel Roubini most of the time in New York. You are a lawyer by training, admitted to the US, but also to the German bar. You focus on the financial sector, of course. You are a regular commentator on markets, but also on TV. This is where I've been following you for years, for example, on NTV, where you also have your own show, Wie Ticked America, amazing, especially when you talk about Trump. But today you're here with me to discuss your very acclaimed uh, best-selling book and also award-winning book, Super Hubs, How the Financial Elite and the Networks Rule our world oh my god if anybody rules my world i see red first of all um sandra let me kick you off with a question super hubs not everybody knows what a super hub is what is it so i try to explain the financial system with network science and network science basically explains how networks operate the dynamics and laws according to which they function and everything in our world consists of networks we consist of networks our brain our environment everything's in like even an ant colony is a, a complex network and so all networks you probably have seen these pictures consist of nodes and nodes are connected with pathways and every system over time has the tendency to grow and become ever more connected and homogeneous and those nodes who are the most connected move to the center of a network where they have the most influence over the network and so there are these types of nodes in every network it could be the queen bee um you know with, with a bee a bee stock or it could be with people who are the most connected in society and specifically in the financial system so in my book i give examples of like for instance a central bank governor Mario Draghi or Christine Lagarde now would be a super hub or you know Jamie Dimon I mean it could be politicians could be billionaires financiers Ray Dalio all these types of people have formed very close personal networks as I'm sure you have also observed behind the scenes it's not always obvious when people see them on the news but they're very closely interlinked and by virtue of their connections these human super hubs have a lot of power so it seems that um, one thing is the power, but power and capital together, together is a real boost. That's a catalyst. Yes, because over these pathways uh, that connect the nodes, the human beings, network currencies are exchanged and that could be social capital. That would be goodwill and favors if, you know, a central bank governor has been helpful maybe that's not the best example let's say a financial politician has been supportive of a certain industry that builds goodwill but it could be any sort of social capital that people build in all segments of society on every level over time but capital of course is also um, a network currency and um, interestingly enough for instance because we are now going through a pandemic for instance a fiat paper currency travels at the same speed and the same pattern with which viruses travel so you see these parallels in all, all types of networks well what i think is very interesting is to have a closer look at the network theory because we all grew up um in a way thinking that networks are a good thing and you have to have connections and if you have connections then you know knowing people is always a good thing because quite frankly you can exchange help um and just information knowledge 
even privileged knowledge amongst each other, which, which gives you an advantage. And Sandra, let me quickly share a screen with you, which I like to do. So also, you know, our, our community sees not only your book, which uh, this is uh, the one you wrote, and you, you brought it out about three or four years ago, the, about the super hubs, but here is like the network science. Do you want to quickly um, comment on it and why this is a good thing, but potentially, if possibly, you know, just pushed to the edge, could it also turn sour on us? Yes, one thing is network science and the other thing is networking. So network science, with network science, I explain the financial system and I explain mechanisms that have led through the increasing fragility of our system and have given rise to protectionism and uh, uh, populism and eventually to the election of someone like uh, President Donald Trump or, or uh, Orban in Hungary and you know Erdogan in Turkey. We see this all over. Uh, and I had to anecdotally explain how these human networks, how they actually make it to the center to, of networks. So these are kind of two separate things that are interlinked, the network science on the one hand, and then the human sort of networking on the other hand. But network science is very important because as I said earlier, um, first of all, it helps us understand complex self-organizing systems. And if we see how they function, it makes it easier to formulate solutions. Um, and um, like I said, all systems become more interlinked over time and become more fragile and then corrective mechanisms kick in to, uh, re to correct the system. Like for instance, in the ecology, if there's for instance, uh, too, many, um, too many animals of one species, then corrective mechanisms kick in or weather phenomena to balance out the system. But humans are too smart for their own good. The human super hubs have so much power they have disabled corrective mechanisms, those natural circuit breakers. And that has led to our system becoming ever more increasingly fragile. So not just on a financial level, which we have experienced in 2008 in the financial crisis. Now we have see increasingly the social instability, but also levels on top of that is now we see more viruses, like uh, many scientists had actually um, prognosticated that we would see. Yeah, and I think what I want to pick up on there, uh, Sandra, and I think this is really the critical point, is the circuit breaker. Because networking um, and, uh, you know, generating advantages for whoever on whatever level, but let's stay with a human, is a good thing up to a certain point. And then it starts damaging the entire system potentially. We saw it in the in the financial crisis 2008. In your book, you also mentioned Meriwether, um, the, uh, the hedge fund guy who really basically brought down back in 1998 the entire financial system with, with his uh, hedge fund. Um, you talk also about Lehman Brothers uh, and Dick Fold, the way he was as a human, um, even though he wasn't the best networker. However, he, he was very much you know monopolizing the power not listening and just doing charging ahead so i wonder this circuit breaking the self-regulation which we see actually in nature where everything is cyclical rather than um rather than linear in its development doesn't necessarily or is is not respected by the human being Right. Like you said, networking up to a certain point is a good thing because everybody wants to do business with people who they like and trust. And trust is, you know, the, the glue of society and in business. And that's actually a good thing. But I think in specifically in the United States, which I focus on in my book, I look at the global financial system, but the focus is on the U.S., I think this uh, narrative of a meritocracy has been overblown. I think we're past the point of meritocracy when actually the top advisors of the president of the United States is his daughter and his son-in-law who have no experience and qualifications for the job. I think we're past the point of a meritocracy. So this is actually an example where circuit breakers have failed. And then the question becomes when humans disable those circuit breakers, will we see a great, because somehow the system has to get rebalanced or otherwise it will ultimately systems who don't correct themselves ultimately destroy themselves that's just a, a, a law of nature so the question is whether now we will see a gradual managed change or whether we see uncontrolled chaos and with you know the 
everything that's going on and all these problems are global and interlinked the virus with the economy with like everything else it looks like it's getting increasingly fragile i i have no idea which way it's going to go but right now it doesn't look very promising especially in the us yeah and i think uh, you're talking now about systemic risk and really whatever happens in the us will affect something in china or somewhere in oceania and vice versa because we are interlinked we are not only a global system but we are really an interdependent network and this is where system theory is also very uh, important for anybody to really look at to understand why whatever i do here in zurich might affect eventually you sandra somewhere sitting in germany right because there are these interlinks and to some level, that's okay. However, if used, or used not in the correct way, or unethical way, it can really, as you were saying, maybe drift into something that is rather unorderly. Yes, um, one law in network science is that up to a certain degree, um, a higher level of connections makes a system more stable because it's more balanced out, but up to only a certain point, after which too many connections actually make a system less stable because the more connections there are, if there is a system, if there's a failure of a node, it can travel more quickly and more easily through the system, which I think we're at this point right now. But well, yeah, uh, expand on that because that is really intriguing. Um, I wonder to what extent, just to play your thought further, we can really put on metrics on human behavior there to control it. All these laws that I um, describe are mathematically corroborated, and I certainly didn't go into that. In my book myself, I basically relied on research of people much more accomplished than I am. But um, so this is all, you know, corroborated. And I think in order to find solutions in, in what is useful is um, complexity thinking. And that the way that works is you look at the system as a whole and you look how different, you don't look at different parts of the system uh, in a separated kind of um, siloed manner, but you look how these parts interact. And basically you can only create solutions if there are problems in a system, if the solution is system wide. If you silo up everything and look at everything as separate um, categories, you know, this economics and social sciences and anthropology and biology, everything separately, like our sciences work, then, um, and you only go for piecemeal solutions, the ultimate solution will fail. And I think that's what we're seeing now. For instance, not only are we not trying to go for global solutions, for instance, in, with climate change or pandemics, no, now we're seeing um, a trend of polarization and protectionism and isolationism. So countries and different parts of the world are just drifting apart further. Donald Trump is withdrawing from institutions like the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, NATO, and all that contributes to further fragility. So instead of trying to go for more globalized solution now that our world has become ever more interlinked through globalization, through technological progress, we're, try we're trying to dial the system backwards and pull the plug. And if you pull the plug on a complex self-organizing system, then you create new problems because it's one thing to say, okay, we want to dial back globalization a little bit, fine. But you have to have planet B. You have to have you know, a replacement mm -hmm. plan because if you want to onshore, for instance, from production from China, you can't do that overnight. You need to build plans. You need to create infrastructure, highways, and, you know, train facilities and all of those things and to just withdraw without a having a fallback plan is set to fail well the fallback plan for trump to be specific sandra seems to be just isolate himself into the america he made great again and um i i wonder to what extent really america at this point is self-sufficient even if you divide out the covid 19 crisis um you know playing habit havoc on a health basis but also economically speaking but i want to pick up some uh, on something you just said and that is you know the entire system because it is interlinked and because we grew that way we created 
this um, interlinked, interconnected, interdependent system. I think the interdependence is what people hate so much about it because they're losing sovereignty to some extent because all of a sudden it's nice to trade with you if I have a benefit, but if I have all of a sudden obligations as well, people don't like it because, hey, I want to be my own boss. So instead of, I was thinking early on, Sandra, instead of from crisis to creation, we are finding ourselves perhaps at a crossroad where from creation to crisis, following on what you were actually establishing in your book, super hubs are great because the finance system is basically what really makes the world go wrong. We have to have it. But reaching a certain point, it, it can just tip over where it then pushes into crisis. And we have seen that before, Senna. We have seen it with 2008. We have seen, you know, John Paulson becoming an overnight billionaire simply because of, uh, you know, the, 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 the real estate crisis. And, and stuff like that happening is not right. But how do you, you know, what is your alternative? How do you, how do you move away from, from uh, crisis to creation, from creation to crisis, from that kind of... Um, dynamics well I would say if you know I think we're kind of past the point a little bit but I think diversity is is a big uh, system stabilizer the famous word of you know with the crisis the financial crisis of 2008 have happened if there had been a Lehman sisters instead of a Lehman brothers and now we have the race issue currently in the United States and you know I can say in the Wall Street that I've worked at it was not diverse at all. I mean, there were hardly people of color. The area that I live in on the Upper East Side in New York, there hardly any people of color live there. So, um, I mean, we hardly have any women on boards despite so much publicity and, and pressure on companies. And that is another law of network science. Um, that is the homogeneity point. Um, in every system, it's the same, but in, specifically in human systems, people like to surround themselves with people who are like them because it makes it easier to relate, it makes it easier to communicate, and white old men like to work with white old men. It, you know, there's less room for trouble. They understand each other. They can't get into me too kind of troubles. It's just so much easier and they feel comfortable. And so everybody else gets squeezed out. And we look at the White House, for instance, it's all old white men, hardly any women. And of course, no, hardly any minorities at all. And so, but you see how these networks, they're very hard to fight because when Obama came to the White House on the ticket of change and very well intentioned, he had to rely on existing networks. It was almost not feasible or doable for him to, you know, manage this uh, big beast of bureaucra bureaucracy in the United States without the established people like Larry Summers and Gene Sperling, all these people have been in government before who could help and bring in their connections to make the system work. So then this became so unpopular that people wanted to disrupt the system and voted for the self-proclaimed self, you know, the disruptor, Donald Trump. So he was not part of, of any established network. Supposedly he was wealthy, which I think was, um, he's, he's just a big fraudster. <laughs> but so he made it to Washington, but he did not have any established networks. He had a son and his, his daughter, I mean, his son-in-law and his daughter to help him because they had gone to Ivy League schools. They were sort of well-connected in the New York scene. And he had some connections, social connections from New York and, you know, the Hamptons and Palm Beach. And so the old networks very quickly, I mean, I watch it sort of in slow motion, how these old networks sort of made their way to Washington. And all of a sudden, even though it was a completely different administration and Republican administration, the same sort of people were at the lever of powers again. So in any sort of system, it's very hard to disrupt because those within the system do everything to um, keep the system that has brought them to power alive. And those system, those people outside of the system don't have any power really to change it. Yeah, and I think this is very much um, visible also in the way 
America handles its politics and how much, um, you know, super hubs, financial super hubs, especially from Wall Street, may or may not support certain candidates in this bipartisan reality that America really is. So in my mind, sitting here in, in Europe, I'm, I'm uh, asking myself, to what extent is democracy democracy if it is a US dollar bill democracy where you do have Wall Street supporting certain political candidates to then, of course, have influence in whatever the policies are. And these policies, guess what, are exactly going to support what you just said, Sandra, to keep up the establishment or at least, let's say, the financial advantages of whoever sponsored the elected president in the first place. Now, that sounds to me somehow very undemocratic. Well, it absolutely is. And the situation is worse in the United States because of money and politics. And this money and politics has over time eroded the whatever meritocracy there was. Because um, another law in network science is that those who already have a lot will gain more. Because in any system, those nodes who have the most connections automatically attract more nodes that could be a biological system but also in in our society people gravitate towards other people who are well connected they have influence they have power they preside over whatever network currency in that specific segment be it professional or social or personal whatever that may be so they become ever more powerful and we've seen this with the billionaires who's become more um uh wealthy throughout these most recent crises. And what we see now, if I were to write my book today, I would probably still write about the financial industry, but I would also have to factor in um, Silicon Valley and tech companies because what we're seeing and what we've seen at the very latest since the last crisis of 2008 is that big companies are becoming ever bigger. Like Amazon started out with books and then they went into goods, household goods and whatever else. And now they're going into delivery. pharmacies, yep. financial services, delivery services, everything. They, they basically go, they, they reign our lives. And that points to another problem, which is we're all part of the system and we all kind of make it work whether we take out a loan from a bank or in any other way, we kind of contribute to the system. So that's why I say, okay, so super, who is the culprit? The super hubs or the system itself? Yeah. And basically it's both. It has, change has to come from the top, but change also has to come from the bottom. So we all have to contribute, even though if we feel powerless, if we all work together, we can affect change. And I think, so eventually we'll either see evolution or we'll see a revolution. And how that may play out, we've seen the first signs in the U.S. where people are actually saying, okay, we have no jobs, we have no health insurance, we, there's no social safety net. Um, that's going to create a revolution. And I think the reason why Donald Trump has reinforced the fence around the White House with another two fences is not just because of what was happening a few, a couple of weeks ago, but because of what he fears will happen, because the only way that he can stay in power is to create more chaos. Yeah, yeah, no, this is, and, and anarchy uh, seems to be like the next thought following on from that, Sandra. A couple of things. I'm very happy that you uh, mentioned, you know, the big tech giants, because I had a look at uh, the latest releases of two sets of people, the most powerful people in the world and who are the top 10 richest. And there's two names that appear on both of the lists. The, the richest, of course, Jeff Bezos, Amazon, and the second richest, Bill Gates, Microsoft. And then when it comes to the 10 most powerful people, also those two appear. So I guess they're, um, you know, super hubs when it comes to the political power, political connections, as well as the financial connections. What I also thought was, um, you know, systems and we are kind of part of the system, but somehow we can't control the system. And I think, okay, so what is the system? And if I think of what sort of construct we are actually engaging in, Sandra, it is based at the end of the day on what you said early on, humans, us humans, first of all. Second of all, we are driven by our values. Now, personally speaking, between you and I and our community, I think the value system here is very monetary, is very much towards, okay, you are, uh, you are rich, you are powerful, you are appealing because you can shift and move things, be it to the good 
be to the bad, but still it is a value. And in the Me Too culture, in the social media culture, everybody knows whether you have money or not, what is going on. So next step, next line of thought. So I said, okay, value. How about if we define, for example, profit or growth in a different way, picking up on, your, on, you, on what you said, Sandra, which is, you know, something has to change. So what about if we define, for example, profits for benefits or growth for evolution or advancement and, for example, stakeholder as community? Would that change anything in our paradigm enough to have a system that is, well, less fragile? Yes, I mean, as you said, that's completely correct. At the root of the problem is our culture, and our culture is determined by our values. And how skewed that is, is if you look at CEOs who in the last decades, you know, make 300 times more than their average worker, while the salary of an average worker has not really increased, despite the fact that efficiency has or productivity has increased by so much. Um, the, the salary that people in the financial industry get, where even Warren Buffett says there, it's completely um, out of control. And now with um, the coronavirus pandemic, we see all these essential workers, the frontline workers, the nurses, people in supermarkets and so forth. They get the, they're the most essential and they get the lowest salaries and they are the first ones to get fired. What you said, trying to redefine paradigms uh, and values, I think is the first step. But there has to be, it's very abstract, it's very analytical. And um, I think there has to be just more of a movement behind it because otherwise it's, since we're all part of the system and we have to kind of function within the system, it's really hard to kind of step out. And Second I breath. don't, yeah. I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't have a, a panacea, but I do think it's a first, I mean, uh, Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum for the last over 40 years, 50 years, has now um, propagated the stakeholder value concept, and it's being discussed, and big CEOs every year, um, you know, talk about it. And, inequality. You know, inequality has always been top of the agenda. <laughs> it's, you know, it's and it. nothing much has happened. Uh, exactly. Quite the contrary, it's gotten increasingly worse, and now with the pandemic, it's said to become even worse even worse and i think this is really really good that you uh, noted that and i think in, in your um book in chapter 12 you touch on inequality and sandra please allow me to share another screen um where is it where is it where is it here uh um, i'm going to share it even though this was more um about systems and how systems work and self-regulate allow me for that but this is the quote i would like to share this is from your chapter between uh, 1979 2013 the wages of the top one people in the u.s we're talking grew by 138 percent you just alluded to it today they earn over 20 percent of the national income the total national in income in the u.s ceos on average make 296 times more than the typical worker exactly the reverse is the case and that is something that i loved as a consequence americans have come to realize that the american dream has been just that a dream dot 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 because the quote continues but what i think this you know, drives into nicely, and that is from the OECD, the latest um, slide on inequality in OECD countries. So it's 40 countries, and I want to point out here, if I may, make it a little bit of a session, what I thought was very interesting. This is inequality. So this is the Gini index. The Gini index for uh, our mentorate community is the, lo the, lo the closer it is to zero means there's less inequality, meaning that the wealth generated by the country is actually distributed quite equally, quite fairly. Um, the higher it goes to number one, the worse it is. Now, look at the United States. It's here. And this is one of the countries with the highest inequality. Look at the United Kingdom, okay, being here. Also, I have to say, I was surprised about Luxembourg, Sandra, and Switzerland, where I'm sitting, is just a nudge over the worst, you know, the, the best third, and also Germany, where you are sitting right now, is here. So we do have here very rich countries. So I do apologize for this very, you know, rickety, rickety way of me sharing screens, trying to be a bit more of a television than coming out of my own office. However, what I'm trying to say is that inequality is a huge issue. 
So everybody's always been trumpeting on about, oh, but we're all getting richer, we are more efficient, we have more technological advances, uh, the digital age brings prosperity. Yes, it does. It does, to the super hubs, um, to, to the unicorns, to the fantastic entrepreneurs, but then the distribution of the actual wealth is very unequal, first of all, and that is being then made worse by the fact that a lot of people, a lot more people know about it because media and information is more available. Hence, what you were alluding to early on, this can really cause uprise, dissatisfaction and people just going on the street. Well, just to tell you anecdotally, when I wrote my book, um, and I, I write a lot about Davos, the World Economic Forum, and every year in January, Oxfam comes out with the inequality report. And when I wrote my book in 2015, I think 80 people had as much wealth as the lower 50%, bottom 50%. Um, approximately and every year this became more extreme and this is like uh, this is a network science law that those who already have a lot get more I think now five years later we are down to like I, I forget 30 people have as much so it's down from 80 you can see every year it became fewer and fewer people mm -hmm. who have most of the wealth in this world and I think there's something Rotten. Actually, wrong with that. Yeah, rotten. And I wonder, you know, you 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 said it earlier on. It's the responsibility of the system, the regulators, the super hubs themselves. But every time you introduce a regulation, I feel the smart people amongst us they always find a loop. So, rigid regulation versus a uh, flexible frameworks coupled with ethics is that a way forward? Yes because our system is so complex and it changes so quickly that a certain level of um, obliquity is, is advisable. Because if we, I mean, I started out in um, uh, advising at Deloitte and Touche institutional investors, and we always had a way of kind of um, outsmarting, you know, tax laws. We all, we'd always find the loophole. We, we were always a step ahead. And by definition, that's always the case and so I think laws and regulations are fine but what we've seen especially in the run-up of the financial crisis was a catch me if you can culture like everything that wasn't prohibit that wasn't explicitly prohibited was taken as allowed and there are a lot of gray zones where if people had had the right compass moral compass they would have um, they would have abstained of doing or from doing certain things. And instead there was like this, uh, there's a name for it. I, I mentioned in the book, it's called Teflonic something where kind of you, you decide to ignore certain things because you kind of know that they're there, but if you willingly um, ignore them, then you don't have to deal with them. And we've seen a lot of that in the financial industry, but you see it all over the place where people have power. So yes, I think laws are important, but also with regard to networks, you can't micromanage and um, supervise and penalize the last bits of personal interaction between people because they may meet on vacations and in their homes and you, you cannot forbid everything. But I think that's where the media comes in is very important in public naming and shaming. And we're also society like we see with Black Lives Matter, we feel go on the streets and dem you know, demonstrate and speak out against these types of behavior and, you know, because people react to incentives and if money is the only incentive, if you're rich and drive a big car and have a private plane, if that is the epitome of the definition of being successful, then of course it's going to skew the system over time. And I think naming and shaming and trying, holding people to a higher standard, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. If you look at President Trump, he's the epitome of not having any shame and honor and squeezing the system. And it's so abhorrent that uh, we can only hope that hopefully soon it'll be over and the pendulum will then probably swing back to the other extreme for a while. For a while to the other extreme and that is uh, bringing us back to, you know, everything uh, moves in circles rather than linear um, to a better. 
I like the notion of whistleblowing. And of course, Assange, I don't want to dr drill into that, but whistleblowing is also a double-edged sword. You do risk. And you always have to think, do, do I risk my own livelihood in order to make the grander scheme of things better? Or how much does it really count that I cast a vote? Will I be hurt? So these are a couple of questions. And, um, you know, there's one documentary that I saw, thanks to you as well, and it was talking about, you know, money driving democracy and politics in the US. And there was this Morris Pearl guy, I think he was a ex-Blackstone, who then um, created the uh, patriotic millionaires. And, you know, coming back to trying to shift the paradigm or, or change the system, it starts with whatever we live, we pass on to the next generation. And I wonder, is this the kind of movement, or, you know, some of the billionaires, like it, it, even I think Soros and, and also Bill Gates, halving their value ever so many years or their, their net worth in order to give it to philanthropy uh, and charity. Is, it, is that what you're thinking about that could correct the system, this autocorrection, which actually doesn't take place uh, with most of the oligarch, be it uh, the Russian or the Americans? Yes, I think we definitely have an oligarchy also in the US. And I think redistribution of wealth is definitely going, has to happen. And again, here's the question is, will it happen in a managed, orderly, systematic way, or will it be chaotic? Because it's just not untenable. If you look at everything that is happening in the United States, I think what many Europeans don't realize is that in the United States, health insurance comes with your job. It's tied to a job. So all these 40 million people who've lost their jobs now will have lost their health insurance. And for instance, I have my own company, so I'm self-insured and I can tell you it's outrageously expensive. And right now I'm in Corona exile in Germany and I have had to do a couple of my yearly checkups here and I cannot believe how inexpensive it is here in, in Germany. So this of course will create unbelievable problems. And Nouria Rubini, my ex-boss just said that uh, in, in the media, he thinks there's a big you know, depression coming. And if people won't be able to make, doing you know, a pay their rent and for get ele electricity and so forth, it's gonna be turned off. Those people are literally are going to be homeless. So um, yeah, so I think redistribution is, is part of the answer, the redistribution of wealth. And actually, I once asked a George Soros, who's very philanthropically minded, and I said, well, you do so, you give so much of your wealth away mm -hmm. um, for good, you know, good for, for good purposes. Um, why don't you just try to change the system more? And he said, well, I'm trying to change the system, but as long as it is the way it is, I optimize the way I operate in the system, because of course he's grown substantially it. richer these last two decades. And um, I think that's the way that many people think. And I think people like um, Bill Gates, who is um, unjustly maligned right now, being, being maligned with regard to the coronavirus, I think he's very well intentioned, his, he and his wife. Yeah, and you mentioned the demonstrations earlier on uh, because of the murder of Floyd, and now we have Brooks adding to it. And there was one, um, you know, one of these banners held up, no justice, no peace, Sandra. <laughs> Neither will ever happen, will it? Well, I mean, I think that in history, they've been, you know, these horrific event, events like the Second World War, and they've sort of leveled out. And after that, we were in a trajectory that was, you know, cooperative, uh, not just within countries, but also internationally. Many of the institutions that have um, ensured our prosperity and peace over the last decades were established after those big wars. But the question is, do humans need these corrective events? I would hope not. But if we don't institute any of these corrective mechanisms right now, and I specifically look to the United States, I think we're in for big trouble. Yeah, so, so uh, in order to conclude our fantastic conversation, Sandra, if you say big trouble, give us a little bit of meat on the bone, play us a scenario what you'd say could come upon us unless we really try this, uh, try to use this moment to recreate or readjust or at least fine tune the system in a more conducive way for the long run? 
Okay, so what super hubs have been very good at doing is to create a narrative um, with which they have sort of kept people on a leash and they've pointed downwards and detract deflected from themselves. And Donald Trump is very good at that and said, you know, we are not the culprits that in your that things are going wrong. First of all, it's a meritocracy in the United States. If you're not successful, it's your own fault because everybody has a chance here to make it to become a millionaire, which is of course social mobility is basically non-existent in the United States of today. Um, so then what has happened is this um, social fragility where minorities are being, you know, Donald Trump has kind of pointed has stoked the flames of racism and, you know, all sort of minorities try to pitch them against each other. And then we have this phenomenon in the United States that people are allowed to carry weapons. And we have these self-proclaimed vigilantes and militia groups and the police kind of lets them get away with it. Apparently we've seen through the last uh, demonstrations and you mentioned my documentary, Vitek America, uh, which I did in 2016 in the run up uh, to the elections, which I was supposed to film right now, but kind of a coronavirus, uh, you know, I had to come over here because things were so dramatic uh, in March and April in New York and nobody was there anyway. Um, but the point is that people at that point, we, we visited, so I, I interviewed super hubs, but I also interviewed very poor people. People that if you live in the Manhattan bubble, you usually don't encounter. And I have to tell you, it was utterly depressing. It's one thing to read about it. It's an, quite another to visit them. And it's not just me saying it. When we visited them, the camera team, everybody on the team were like depressed for three days. It was so horrific. But those people were so poor but they all had numerous weapons and their children even had weapons like teenagers. And, um, and they were saying, yeah, I think we'll see civil war. And it sounds so outrageous. It's like civil war. How's that even supposed to work? Like, how, what do you mean? And he said, that, keep in mind, that was two years ago. Well, you know, like Charlottesville, there's a demonstration, people coming together, someone fires a shot, and then, you know, other people strike back, and all of a sudden you have, you know, dozens of, of dead people. Now, we've, we haven't gotten to that point, but what we've seen a couple of weeks ago sort of points in that direction. So because so many Americans are armed, I don't, I don't think we'll see a full-blown, um, you know, civil un civil war, but we definitely see civil unrest. And research has shown that those countries who have well-functioning institutions are the, you know, are the most prosperous and most stable. And in the United States, we've seen Donald Trump has sort of um, undermined institutions. He has not even, he has not put people in positions within those institutions, or he's killed those institutions or withdrawn from them. So you see everything is kind of deteriorating. And so to get back to your question, I think you see the fragility of the, of the societal cloth. And that in the end brings further economic instability, which ties into social instability, which ties into the whole system becoming more fragile and being prone to failure. Now, there's a couple of more questions I'm curious about. First of all, I was wondering, you know, super hubs sounds really good to me. Um, and then I thought, well, the line between super hubs, which has a positive connotation in my mind, could also be super bullies. And for you, is Trump a super hub or a super bully? Well, I think the term super hub is kind of agnostic. It's kind of neutral. It just says that by the virtue of his position, unfortunately, he is the center, the central node within the political system of the United States. So that by virtue of his position, he has a lot of power, but obviously he's a bully. He has no behavioral, behavioral standards. I do think he is mentally ill. Um, I think he's dangerous. He's not equipped for this position. I've said this since the outset from before he was even elected. And I thought that was a 50, 50% that he would be elected. And now my worry is uh, he's very, I don't think he's intellectually smart, but he's got a, a really kind of gut instinct that has served him very well. And that, you know, lets him recognize people's weaknesses. And my worry is Joe Biden just said, oh, he's worried about uh, Donald Trump not leaving the Oval Office if he loses the election. I don't even get to that worry. I think that Donald Trump sees that. And if that were to happen, yes, people could get rid of him somehow. You can physically remove someone. 
My worry is that he will either suspend the elections because he knows if there is a is an election, his chances are you know very low that he would be elected or that he stacks the odds in his favor by virtue of cyber influencing through Russia or China, who, whoever can help him remotely, maybe this time really hacking into voting machines, which is suspected happened in some locations even last time around, only it wasn't, people hadn't been able to prove it 100%. Um, and of course, keeping people from voting. I'm afraid that Trump will unfairly influence the elections or even not like avoid the elections yeah this is why john, from happening. yeah and this is why i think john bolton's book should come out because it uh, he just dropped uh, you know a hint on pension saying that you know trump actively as a super hub um reached out to another super hub which is xi jinping to help him out a little bit so um i wonder whether that would tweak perhaps um the elections more than uh you know a stock market that comes back up and bounces back up i don't know but uh anyway you know what i also thought was very very interesting sandra was um you describing uh, in chapter 11 some of these super hubs which kind of turned sour and made the system turn sour rick fall john merriweather and mike milk and the bond the bond king um and i was reading and kind of selectively picking up words such as testosterone driven macho alpha male blow himself up domineering confrontational brutal formulations obliteration neglect to build goodwill best not to be challenged misjudging the mood and i just thought who's she talking about who's she writing about sounds awfully familiar of somebody that at the moment <laughs> at the moment is at the helm of the us sandra um, thank you so much for your super insight. Your book is magnificent. I think it's an absolute must read to, you know, to get a real good segue in our system, the world, the way the world really does tend to work. And um, it's, it's a bitter pill, but I think swallowing that is the first way perhaps to remedy. I was just trying to offer a different lens through which to view things. And it turned out to be very timely. And I think if we understand the problem, uh, it's the first step of trying to counteract it. And I think what we've also learned in this crisis, and especially in the Trump uh, presidency, uh, you know, all living and we all live in these echo chambers, um, that we kind of need to step out of it. And things that seem inconceivable are actually quite possible. Thank you so much uh, for being Thank here with me. Uh, Sandra, you're awesome. Uh, I've been following you for years. You know, keep up that wonderful work. And yes, thank you for, for joining me on Mentory TV. Thank you for having me, Patricia. I very much enjoyed our conversation. It's been fun. Thank you so much. And thank you, dear Mentory TV community, for joining me yet again for a conversation, this time with Sandra Navidi. Stay tuned. And uh, well, let me know your thoughts, your ideas, suggestions, what you would like to maybe have me drill deeper about, reach out to people, to the real experts that can tell you a little bit the backstage stories uh, in order to, you know, mentor us all. They live it, they share it, they mentor it. So stay tuned and I'll see you soon. Bye.